together. You have heard this morning about the complexity of the human rights system. I'm going to add to this complexity a specific presentation on one of the treaties that were referred to this morning and show you also that the challenges ahead, as my colleague Mr. Richard said this morning, is on how do we bring all of this in a harmonious, in a much more harmonized way in the interest of pushing the agenda of human rights. This is a big challenge. The system has been grappling with this challenge for many years. One of the last attempts recently has been the treaty body strengthening so that we don't have a lot of duplication because we do have duplication in our work. This morning, again, Professor Roman referred to economic social rights are covered by so many treaties. Uh, the, ref the reference was made as well to how many uh, recommendations are out there for follow-up. So imagine how state parties at the end are fed up with the system. There's too much and there's too little capacity, especially when we speak about developing countries, to follow up, to prepare reports, to follow up on reports. And what we want is not more and more bureaucracy. We want results, we want impact. So I'll try to explain maybe why do we still have some specific treaty that mean a lot and why is it that gender issues in relation to economic, social and cultural right are still extremely relevant. If we take a few minutes just to think about uh, women's right and why do we still emphasize them. We know that the women, women's rights are, are entitlements that are claimed for women and by women because they are also claimed, thank God, by men. So let's not forget that this is a struggle for all of us. It's a struggle for the future. It's a struggle for a much more balanced uh, world for our daughters, our sons, etc. So we're not in this battle against anyone. That is one thing. We know that some countries have been able to institutionalize these rights and support them by law, local customs, behavior. And we know that in some other parts, it is much more difficult because some of these rights are ignored or suppressed. So we, this is a fact, this is a reality. And we know also that um, the, 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 the rights of women differ from the broader notions of human rights, although we consistently repeat that women's rights are human rights, but they differ in the sense that there is an inherent historical and traditional bias against the exercise of the rights by women and girls in favor of men and boys. We have to admit it, this has been the case in Western societies until recently, and is still the case in many other parts and societies. What, is, uh, what are the issues that are associated with women's rights? They include, although they are not uh, only limited to bodily integrity, autonomy, the right to vote, the right to hold public office, to work, to birth control, to fair wages, and many of these issues were alluded to again in this morning presentation. To, uh, to own property, to education, to have marital and parental rights. So all of this movement started already back in the 19th century when uh, women and some men also began to ask, demand, and then agitate and demonstrate for the rights to vote. And this was granted gradually, the first country being New Zealand. I'll take the right to vote as a, as a, as a very uh, important uh, right and show you a little bit how it evolved very quickly in history until the UN um, existence and then we can move to the history of women issue within the UN. So the right to vote, as I said, the first country was New Zealand in 1893, then it was followed by Australia in 1902, then by a number of Nordic countries in the early 20th century. And for you here, the Russian Federation, you had, with the Russian Revolution, uh, the provisional government granted universal suffrage with equality between men and women. This is a big thing for your country and you keep this acquired right and you can build on it even more and address areas where maybe setbacks are occurring. So with the end of the First World War, many other countries followed. 
Netherlands, Austria, I'm not going to name them. You can find all this information on, on very different um, uh, sites, uh, including the inter Interparliamentarian Union site, which is a very interesting one with regard to, to women representation in politics. But just to give you an example so that we are not about naming and shaming when we speak about um, the, the lack of, of, uh, of um, uh, meeting the obligation of certain state parties, uh, can you believe that Switzerland gave the right to vote to women only in 1971? And I am also a Swiss national. I'm a binational, by the way, so I'm authorized to speak about Switzerland. I'm Lebanese and Swiss. And can you believe that Liechtenstein only gave the right to vote in 1984? These are realities. This is the way the world is. And this is why I think in areas of human rights, there should be a move away from naming and shaming because each country has a certain aspect that has to be addressed and has to be uh, to effect progress on it. So how come the UN uh, made this commitment to the advancement of women? It began with the signing of the UN Charter. We heard this morning from Richard a lot about the charter based. I would like to consider CEDAW, although it's a treaty, it's also a charter based because the charter of the UN, although there were all very few women uh, in, among the 51 uh, delegation signatories of the charter, the, these women succeeded in inscribing women's rights in the founding document of the United Nations, which reaffirms in its preamble faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. This is clear cut rooted in the charter. Then we have uh, after the, in, in the 1947, we start with the UN uh, uh, establishing the Commission on the Status of Women. And with this, uh, the, the establishment of this commission, it had requested it to consider and make policy recommendation to improve the situation of women. And the CSW, which is still in existence, it's still an organ that is operational, that is operating, which is composed of the state parties elaborated the Convention on the Political Rights of Women. And we heard this morning from Professor Roman why there was this split between the political rights and the other rights and how state parties didn't feel like one instrument will be able to cater for all the needs. Yet, we see also that uh, from uh, between 1947 and 1962, that the Commission focused on setting standards and formulating international conventions to change discriminatory legislation and foster global awareness of women's issues in contributing to the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have again here something that shows that uh, women's rights are really anchored in the Charter, in the Declaration, and uh, when uh, the um, uh, CSW successfully argued against references to man as a synonym for humanity, and it succeeded in introducing new, more inclusive language. So you see, this is a really a process that has been going over time, and we saw that um, a number of treaties have been prepared in uh, that period uh, between 49 and 59, and uh, including the Convention on Political Rights, the Convention on the Nationality of Women, and in between 46 and 67, also the CSW prepared the famous declaration on the elimination of discrimination against women. And this is important to note, it was only a declaration. Why did we get afterwards to a convention? Because the declaration did not have any binding effect. So it was felt after years of the declaration in existence that uh, we needed something to, uh, to, to create some obligations to state party. And we go in that sense with what Professor Roman said also about the respect, the protect, and the fulfill, the three dimensions that are essential and that treaty uh, are enshrined in a treaty. So as I said, it was not binding obligation for state, and therefore uh, it, it was felt that um, we need to consider preparing a treaty. The CSW started to uh, consider that in 1972 and uh, to have more binding effect. And during the famous 1975 World Conference on Women uh, um, that uh, has adopted the World War Plan of Action, 
uh, there was a specific call for a convention on the elimination of discrimination against women. And the UN proclaimed the, the decade of 76 to 85, a decade, UN decade for women. And in 79, during that decade, CEDAW as a convention was adopted by the UN uh, General Assembly. So all of this historical background is to tell you how uh, this process can be slow, tedious, difficult, until you get to the formulation of an instrument. Then there was the mid-decade World Conference, and then uh, when the, uh, after 30 days after the 20th member state ratified CEDAW, the convention entered into force. Today, what do we have? We have 189 countries out of 193 UN member states that have ratified or acceded to CEDAW. But I'm not going to enter into this arena of reservation. What does it mean? Many of these countries have posed reservation in their ratification. Sometimes, in my view, reservation that nullifies the, the, the implementation of the convention. But this is a different discourse, and this is something more for the Secretary General to be more forceful and to uh, refuse ratification where reservation nullify the impact, but it's not happening. Now, what are the state parties' obligation under the convention? Essentially, I don't want to, do, we have 16 articles. They are very important, and I will point you to the website where you can look at the text of the convention if you are interested. But I want to take you through some of those to be able to focus on the one that are really fo uh, on economic, social, and cultural rights. And this is the essence of the summer school, and you want to see the link between what the treaty body brings on this particular aspect of rights. But still, because this convention is uh, raison d'etre, is to fight against discrimination, it's interesting to see here what is the definition of discrimination in the context of the convention. I give you a few seconds to read, or do you want me to read out loud? Because I am mindful of the time. Now, I think I'm okay. Okay, so we're talking about any distinction, exclusion, restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status, on a basis of equality of men and women, of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or any other field. I think this is really clearly states that CEDAW is about the economic, social, cultural rights, as, as well as the political and civil rights. But what does this mean concretely? for you, young student, and later on, maybe working in the public service or in, in, in the, uh, with the civil society. It means that you have to ask yourself, does, does the, my, the constitution of my country guarantee equality of men and women and prohibit discrimination based on sex and marital status? You have to ask yourself, are there laws or policy statements that define discrimination against women? Do they cover acts that cause or result in difference in treatment? Do they cover law, do, do they include laws, practices, policy which prevent women's enjoyment of all rights? Do, does these practices which may unintentionally be discriminatory in effect uh, are, are in existence? Is discrimination by private institutions or individuals or in the domestic sphere, you know, uh, prevailing in your country? This is more concrete how you can uh, yourself uh, ask these questions and also call to accountability your public sector and as well engage your civil society sector. Uh, the, in in our Article 2, uh, we, there is this obligation to eliminate discrimination. So states party have to condemn discrimination against women in all its form, and they have to agree to pursue by all appropriate means and without delay a policy of eliminating discrimination against women, and to this end, they, ha they have to undertake to embody the principle of equality in the national constitution and or other appropriate legislation, to adopt appropriate legislative and other measures, including sanctions where appropriate, prohibiting all discrimination against women, to establish legal protection. We come from the respect to the protect here of the rights of women on an equal basis with man. And then you see that um, Why? Uh, technology. 
there's a bug. It's not moving. Okay, if it doesn't work, I can continue from my writing notes, but I don't know why it's bugged. Oh. Okay. okay, what, what happened? Okay. What shall I not do? No, just <laughs> Correct? Just oh, enter. Just okay. Uh, okay. So, um, um, what I wanted also to, um, to uh, highlight, maybe we leave uh, for a second the article by article, and uh, we go back, okay, and we go back to, to, um, to the, um, what it means in the country, may basically, I think this is important. Okay. So, what it means, uh, the obligation to eliminate discrimination? It, it, uh, it extends to public authorities and institutions, of course, that they have a role, a proactive role, and to private persons, organizations, and enterprises. It, asks, it makes us ask the question, if there are any policies or practices of government and other public institutions that discriminate against women? If there are, again, any laws or administrative measures or other practices that discriminate? And if, uh, the, uh, if we can identify the areas in which women are discriminated against. And I'd like you to keep this point in mind because maybe when we reach the, you know, the discussion, I would like to invite you, like Professor Roman did, to tell me, in your views, which are the area where, uh, you know, uh, you have, that you identify uh, as being area where women are discriminated against in your context. And then, uh, when we move to Article 3, we look at the, the importance of, of uh, adv the development and advancement of women in terms of uh, the, the state's party obligation to take uh, in all fields, in particular in the political, but also social, economic, and cultural fields, all the measures, including legislation, to ensure proper development. So the question again come here about do existing laws, practices, etc. You have to question every time yeah, the, your, the institution about uh, the, the situation uh, with respect to each article. Then, of course, it was clear after all those years from the declaration uh, to the convention that not much progress was being obtained in terms of you know, uh, accelerating the equality between men and women. So there was this, what we call, temporary special measure. This is a very important article that is often not properly understood by countries because they consider that if you are imposing a quota or you are imposing uh, some limited in time policies, you are creating a sort of reverse discrimination. I think this is, has to be demystified. Temporary special measures have been used in many, many countries to remedy a situation where low representation of women remained uh, in the political sector because women were not encouraged, were not empowered, for instance, or in other fields, including sometimes basic fields such as education, where we needed some temporary special measures to bring the, the, the participation of women up to the expected level. So these measures are called temporary because when we reach the desirable uh, uh, balance, they will be uh, abandoned. It's not going to be forever, but there is a resistance very often in certain country to, to these uh, measures. So uh, as, as was uh, mentioned earlier, this article recognizes from practice that even when you have sometimes a good legal equality, the equality uh, the, the jury is something, and the equality de facto is a totally different thing. You may have text on paper that are really solid, etc., but still, when you come to the ground and you assess the situation, you're not there. This is where this type of measure can help. We have, again, then, um, to address a very, very important uh, dimension that leads to discrimination, which is the uh, issue of stereotyping. And I think there is no free society from stereotypes. And this is probably the most difficult area where 
some of the work that is being done here in this course, in this summer course, is part of helping you to question your own representation of other, the other, not only of women, the one who is different from me, the one from a different ethnic, from a different race, from a different religious community. The stereotypes are so hard to overcome, and yet they are essential to effect change. And I agree with my colleague Richard, who spoke also about the change process that are a different path, that each country has its own rhythm, and that we are here collectively to accompany the country in that, provided there is a commitment to go in, the, in that direction and take the time necessary to effect the mental uh, attitudinal change. And so stereotyping will continue to be a very big, important area affecting women, but not only women. So uh, we know that we have this uh, sex roles and models, and very often now in certain societies where uh, some kind of um, religion's um, law is coming back, there is a return, there is a setback in going back and putting women, and limiting them to their role as mothers in the house. It's not at all our intention to diminish the importance of women, mothers' role when women choose to be mothers. But the issue is that if you reduce them only to that, then the setback is definitely going to be much more difficult to address. So we have to um, uh, ensure that family education includes a proper understanding of maternity as a social function and the recognition of the common responsibility of men and women in the upbringing and development of their children. Uh, and so it is important uh, that in each country, uh, one while respecting cultural and traditional practices and ways of life, uh, that it should be very clear that there is no tradition, no culture that justifies treating any segment of the population without respect for their dignity. And I think this, we all agree, this is the bottom line. It's about dignity, respect of the person as a person. So we have to be careful when a religion or custom impose practices or beliefs that interfere with the improvement of the status of women. And if they exist, we don't go and clash with them. We try to understand them. We try to address them. We try to overcome them. But it is very important to know that the roles that men and women are expected to play in society and in the family can be specific, are not identical, but they deserve the full recognition for each one. Uh, we have also a dimension in, and on the issue of stereotyping that is very alarming and it is increasingly alarming is the uh, males and females are increasingly stereotyped in the media. And this again becomes because all the young generation is influenced. Now again with the social media, there's a big domain of you know, po potential harm that could come if we do not manage it responsibly. Um, so you have before you also certain other question that you can ask yourself. Um, uh, for, I will take, for instance, um, uh, the last po bullet point that is on, on this uh, slide. How is violent behavior between spouses perceived by women and men? You know, violence against women is a much larger spread than you can ever think. It is there, it exists. But the, the issue is that very, very many society want to be silent about it. They don't want to acknowledge its existence. Uh, they don't want to address it. But they also, some of it, they can find some justification for it. And that is the much worrying part. So we have to also be uh, aware and alert of that. Uh, under Article 6, you will see also issues referred to again earlier by Professor Roman in particular on the issue of trafficking, the exploitation on trafficking in women. Uh, we know that this is again another very uh, sad uh, trend that is uh, now with the cross-border trafficking and with transnational crime, etc. Women are mainly victims, women and girls, of this traffic. So. Um, we have to look at to the legislation in each country, and I recall that in his uh, presentation, Professor Roman referred to this as one of the points of the report uh, that was addressed to the Russian Federation in 2011. 
what are the improvements, what is the status of the legislation to, prefer, to prevent traffic in women and girls, uh, what is the issue concerning prostitution, is prostitution is illegal, uh, who is uh, uh, being uh, um, uh, penalized, um, and if prostitution is legal, do sanctions exist to protect prostitutes from exploitation, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So I think uh, uh, it is a very important article, Article 6, and as I said, with the trend of trafficking that is increasing, we see that as, as a key uh, important article. Now, if we move to Article 7, which focuses on political and public life, here again, sorry? Please. Uh, you mentioned one question about, yes, uh, the fourth one. Uh, what is the prevailing social equity of the Constitution? And does the UN and the political community have um, some data about uh, this question? And uh, maybe is there any reports about Russia? Because uh, actually in Russia, I haven't seen any, uh, any uh, researches on this question. Can you ask me? Okay. Uh, I have to say that the, on the issue of, uh, of prostitution in particular, there is um, a debate currently because, as you know, many Western countries now are uh, put, putting sanctions also on client and are declaring prostitution illegal. Within the committee, I don't think there is a shared view on all of this. So uh, we, there is um, some work and some research being done to see what is the best advice. With, with, currently, we work from the present system in each country that we are di in, 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 uh, undergoing dialogue with. So if you have a country where prostitution is legal, we will ask the question that ultimately seek the protection of the women who have to practice prostitution. When we know it is illegal, we still ask about how to protect their right. But it's true, you are, you are raising a very valid question. There is not one uniform vision on, on this pro. There is no one uniform uh, uh, vision on this, uh, on this subject. So I go back. Please uh, do interrupt me if you have questions similar to, to the colleague that is relevant to one slide. Don't, don't hesitate. I should have uh, suggested that earlier. Sorry. So in Article 7, again, I think it's very important that since we started with the right to vote being a very paramount right in, in projecting women's ability to elect and be elected to office, it is extremely important to see uh, how uh, women are granted this right and how they are re in, rea in reality practicing it. And so we want to uh, be able to, to, to assess if the women have the right to vote in all elections on equal terms with men, are they exercising this right? Or is something deterring them from exercising it? What could it be? Uh, we want to also know are there any, any factor that prevent them from political participation. Very often it's financial. Very often it's political parties who do not encourage women and who do not have women on their list. So there is a, a, a gamut of, of, of things that have to be considered and addressed. Again, Article 8, uh, which is also of relevance to representation and engagement of women in public uh, sector, but also in the judiciary, also in the diplomatic field, also in all, at all level of international representation of the government. With this, you can see assess progress. You can see countries like 20 years ago when they submitted the initial report to CEDAW, what was their statistics and what happens now. You can see sometimes countries who have setback instead of continuing to capitalize and progress, you have setbacks and then you have to look into what is provoking the setback. How to address uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, they had so many high level uh, representation and now women are absent from the judiciary or the police or other sector. I will not to dwell very much on that because I want to reach the article that are very much on the economic, social, and cultural rights. But still, I think nationality, which is uh, the, 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 the most important right, it's, it has been said that nationality is the right to have rights. If you do not have a nationality, many of the rights that derive from nationality, you won't have them. You won't have housing, you won't have the right to health, you won't have anything. You're like nobody, you're, you're like a, um, you know, a shadow. So nationality 
uh, are, is a key issue and women have had difficulties historically because when they um, uh, get married very often, uh, some countries would uh, consider that if they get their husband's nationality, that will deprive them from their original nationality. Uh, and imagine afterwards, when if there is a divorce or a separation, how to go back and regain your nationality, let alone the whole issue of uh, you know passing your nationality to your children. Very many countries do not give women the right to to transmit nationality until uh, today. So this is uh, also an extremely important area. Uh, and whether women are married or not, if they have the equal rights to acquire, change, or retain their nationality. And what are the social, cultural, or economic factors that affect a woman's exercise of these rights? And the fact, as I said, to when you marry a non-citizen or change in nationality, uh, what happens to the women in, in, uh, in this case? Um, Again, here the issue of discrimination is blatant, is very clear. Men usually give quickly nationality to their foreign spouse, much quicker than women, and, uh, and they give it automatically to their children. And so even in sort of quote-unquote developed countries, so this is a big issue. Now I can you know, start focusing on, on a very, very important article that is education, because all of women's empowerment starts with education. And this Article 10, as um, you um, can see, has a lot of sub uh, points that are extremely important to ensure access to same curricula, same quality of teaching, access to school proper, address dropout of girls from school, uh, and all the aspects that uh, concern scholarship, that concern field of studies, the scientific fields. The stereotyping comes back under education because girls are supposed to do literature or, uh, you know, have uh, uh, jobs that are um, women type of job and uh, leave the sphere of uh, research and sciences, etc. And the fact that we um, are also very much uh, concerned about uh, the, the, sometimes the financial uh, ability uh, of a family to have children uh, uh, go to school and giving preference to sending the boy and keeping the girl at home, so-called because the access to school maybe is not safe, for many different reasons. So this, this is an area that really uh, links very prop directly to the uh, economic, social, and, and cultural rights, and that is of paramount importance, let alone when we speak about right to education in countries in conflict or in crisis or in region where really the, 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 the insecurity becomes a factor of preventing girls to, to get to school. And again, in this uh, context, you can have so many uh, questions to reflect on. Uh, to ensure that, that, uh, that there is no discrimination, or at least that discrimination is being addressed. Article 11 is, um, is uh, again at the heart of this economic and, and social right. This is about employment. So state parties are really asked to take all measures to eliminate discrimination in the field of employment in order to ensure on a basis of equality of men and women the same rights in particular the right to work as an inalienable right of all human beings. And we know that in some society, women are discouraged from working because it doesn't tally with the role that society uh, foresee for them. I am not necessarily for the women working all the time at any cost. Women can choose not to work as well and concentrate on something else, as long as they are equipped to work and that it is their choice. It's, uh, so you have to understand me, really. I, I've worked all my life, and I, sometimes I regret that I was not more uh, able to, to be more present when I, my, my kids were very young. So I understand the dilemmas. It's not that I'm suggesting that this is at any cost, but as long as it is their choice and they are supported in their choice by the society, then I have no problem. But the right to the same employment opportunities, including the application of the same criteria for selection in matters of employment, the right to free choice of profession and employment, the right to promotion, the job security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And again here, the right to equal remuneration was also mentioned earlier this morning, the right to social security, 
And there was also a point that is very important under employment and that we come back we come back to it, unfortunately, because it's, again, a practice that is spread, spreading. It is sexual harassment in the workplace. If you do not manage to protect women from potential sexual harassment in the workplace, this is deterring them from seeking employment and going. So it is, again, a way that leads to concretely to discrimination. I think also that there are many other issues that um, here talks about the maternity leave with pay, to, to give parental leave, even now more and more we are asking so that fathers can also be uh, sharing uh, when the, the baby is born the, their responsibility and creating the bond with their child. And also uh, uh, to, on, on the issue, as we said, of protection, to provide a special protection to women during pregnancy uh, in types of work which could have been harmful to them. Because there are, WHO has a classification of a type of work where pregnant women should not be exposed. So again, under this Article 11, uh, you know, the several many questions that are here before your eyes, you could, you know, think about it and see in your own context what does apply, where is the, is there any distinction in the recruitment and employment practices? Um, if women are entitled by law to receive equal pay for equal work, um, I think maybe in the, in the context of um, the Russian Federation, maybe the, the labor law on paper is fine, but maybe the implementation of it is weak. So again, let's not forget, we're talking about equality de jure and equality de facto. So we should not just be happy with legal texts that are not really um, uh, um, actionable, that are not yielding results. Uh, Article 12 in the equality and access to healthcare again is a very important uh, uh, article because we know that uh, the uh, whole issue of, uh, you know, um, healthcare it can be completely disempowering if there is a lack of health care, which is very often more, you know, affecting more rural regions than, than uh, um, uh, urban regions. But still, uh, women, um, or elderly women, disabled women, and these are areas, I open here a parenthesis to speak about multiple discrimination, that you are women, you're in rural area, and you're disabled. So imagine how many type of discrimination you uh, will be facing to access the, the basic health services the, that you require. Um, uh, keeping an eye on the watch. Okay, um, Article 13. This is one of the articles that I love, which in my view is not enough uh, understood by state parties. I have been a member of this committee for the past two and a half years, and I feel like we skim on social and economic benefits while they are so important. The sta Article 13 states that the, the state party shall take appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in other areas of economic and social life in order to ensure on a basis of equality of men and women the same rights in particular the right to family benefits, the right to bank loans, mortgages, other forms of financial credit, the right to participate in recreational activities, sport, and in all aspects of cultural life. This is the only article where cultural life is stated clearly. So, but again, unfortunately, when we do dialogue, even when the countries come with their report, they don't provide information. It's like, you know, it's a neglected aspect. So we try to refocus them on this Article 13 and increasingly show them that there are area for improvement and that, uh, you know, um, some of these questions also point you to this area of improvement uh, that one can pursue. Like, for instance, what are the legal, social, economic, or cultural barriers 
preventing women participation in recreational activities, sports, or any aspect of cultural life. We need to see if there are invisible barriers, if there are, and we want to know is if women have access to, to, to those forms of credits that we spoke about earlier, the bank loans, the mortgages, and if they can do it on their own or they need the consent of the husband, which was the case until very recently in many Western countries. I think in France, women were not able to have an independent bank account until maybe 40 years ago or something like this. So these are not just, you know, uh, imagination issues. They are real. Then we have a particular article, again, which is not given enough attention uh, in all countries, but that is paramount importance, and that is rural women. As mentioned earlier about, you know, multiple discrimination, you're a woman, you're a woman in rural area, and you are handy. The moment you are a woman and you are in a rural area, you are already more vulnerable because you don't have access to the same services, because you don't have the same facilities, because you are usually in that sector is the informal economic sector agriculture. It's not a sector that is protected by social security, etc. So this is an area of concern. And Article 15 is the equality before the law and in civil matters. And this is extremely important. By the way, CEDAW, as you heard earlier from uh, Professor Roman, about what they call general recommend, what we call in the committee general recommendation, and I will speak to you about that uh, in a very brief while, uh, is preparing a general recommendation on women access to justice, because this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, rights. And so um, uh, I'll conclude with this extremely important Article 16, which is the last article, which is about equality in marriage and family law. And this is such a huge and important sector that is very uneven between countries, also because of the forceful tradition and customary law. But this is where we're trying to work incrementally to accompany state parties to move on with their, um, with their uh, uh, progress in implementing the, the uh, Okay, yes, Rustam. <laughs> so we are going to go to this one now. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Uh, very, very briefly now, uh, the committee itself, we were speaking then about the convention. The committee, very briefly, it was established under Article 17 of the convention, consists of 23 experts. They are elected by secret ballot uh, and they serve for four year terms. And consideration is given to equitable geographic distribution and representation of different forms of civilization and principal legal system. This is extremely important for what you're talking about, economic, social, and cultural right. The more a committee has a wide representation, the better it can interact and serve uh, the countries uh, that it is uh, examining. And they do serve in their personal capacity and they are not linked at all to their country. So what it does, it, 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 we consider state's party report. I'll go quickly on that because it was presented by Professor Roman in the context of his uh, committee, but it is similar. And uh, just uh, we uh, be, bear in mind that we also do make suggestion to UN organs, who, especially those that are sitting in country and they have to pursue their, in their own uh, role uh, the, the implementation of the recommendation. And uh, also we do um, uh, have produce, as I said, uh, general recommendation. We have produced up today 32 re general recommendation. I'll show you the topics when I conclude, and I invite you to look at them. This is the current composition of the committee uh, uh, as, as at uh, 31 January 2015. And um, uh, the, uh, the other aspect that I wanted to, to um, or allude to very, 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 very briefly, is the type of documents that we work on, which is called the, core, the common core document that, that each country has to prepare for all the human rights uh, machinery that you heard about. It's valid for the UPR, it's valid for the uh, special rapporteur procedure, it's valid for different treaty. So this is a basic important document, the core common document, and we increasingly want these core docu common document to be up 
updated regularly. And we look at reports from civil society of each country. Uh, they present the shadow report, which is very important to, you know, um, to check against what the state party is reporting reality. And we also receive confidential reporting from UN agencies. Um, um, uh, we have uh, the uh, constructive dialogue exactly as described by, by Professor Roman for that other committee. Uh, and we have the concluding observation. And again, in the case of CEDAW, uh, it's every four years that the country has to submit its report. Uh, we have, we need make sure that, that they report on the implementation of the Beijing platform. And now we will make sure that they will report on uh, the post 2015 development agenda because we have moved now to the second phase. We also ensure for country that is relevant, the resolution of Security Council 1325 on women in conflict is also activated and we make sure that they also build on the previous concluding observation. Uh, we report to, to, to the Secretary General on our activity and the Secretary General uh, report on the implementation of the convention regularly to the General Assembly. We, uh, we um, also uh, try to, uh, this is just showing you a little bit the functioning of a session, but this is too detailed, you don't need it. Just for a quick word on the optional protocol, as was mentioned again this morning, uh, the, each treaty has developed with time an optional protocol. CEDAW has its pr optional protocol. Only 109 countries have ratified this protocol up to date. And this uh, reporting uh, obligation um, is, um, was, was in fact launched, uh, uh, especially during the Vienna, as was mentioned again by Professor Roman, the Vienna 1993 World Conference on Human Rights, and then the GA adopted the protocol uh, for uh, CEDAW in 1999. And now I think uh, that uh, briefly this, this, this uh, optional protocol is a communication procedure, but you cannot seize the committee until you have exhausted all national remedial measures. This is very important. But still, I can say that, uh, that CEDAW receives a lot of communication and that uh, the, uh, there are certain criteria that are listed here on which I will not dwell too much because of uh, the time constraint. I really want you to be able to ask me questions. So uh, this presentation will stay with OHCHR office. So if you wish, it can be shared with you if you find it interesting. Uh, and. Um, uh, it is um, um, my intention to conclude by uh, telling you that uh, you have a real important body of, of knowledge uh, in, the, um, in the form of, uh, of general recommendation that the committee produced. And uh, the committee, okay. The committee, as I said, uh, uh, produced uh, since its inception uh, 32 uh, recommendations. And they are, just have a look here, please, as the variety of subject matters. And they are so important, they take a lot, a lot of work, and they have to be adopted by consensus by the 23 experts, which is not an easy task. But I can tell you that this, as was mentioned by Professor Roman, soft law are provide guidance for country to deal with the different topic that you have before your eyes, such as the um, issue on temporary special measures, or the effectiveness of the national machinery, on the resource issue, on the violence against women. And just for your information, we had two on violence against women, 12 and 19. And now we are going to produce a more updated uh, GR on violence against women because, as I said, the phenomenon is still very much largely you know, um, um, spread around the world. You have also um, uh, many um, uh, specifics on older women, on uh, women migrant workers, but uh, the, the few that I want to, to refer to are the ones that were adopted well, since I joined, and they really represent a lot 
for me, uh, and that is uh, the number 29 on the economic consequences of marriage, family relations, and their dissolution. And number 30 on women in conflict prevention, conflict and post-conflict situations. And the 31 on harmful practices, including circumcision of a girl. And, uh, and, and the 32 on gender-related dimensions of refugee status, asylum seekers, and statelessness. And we have, as I said in the pipeline, on women access to justice and women and disaster risk reduction and climate change. These are two general recommendations that are in the pipeline. Um, uh, so uh, uh, let me just move quickly to the last. Yeah. So you have them all, all of them are there. So it has been like the committee has been in existence the 32, 33 years. It has 32 general recommendations. It's enormous. It's a lot of work. And in conclusion, I want really to point you to three websites that are, I think I really dumped a lot of information on your shoulder. And I'm sorry because sometimes it I cannot digest them, especially after lunch. They are not <laughs> digestible. But um, you have these websites. You have, of course, the office uh, of OACHR that is present in the Russian Federation, that is really uh, in touch with, um, with the um, universities and institution. If you want to pursue a question, please don't hesitate. And I would like really now to ask you if you have been able to take some of this presentation uh, and digest it, what would be the areas that would be mainly of concern to you when it comes to discrimination against women and what will be also the remedies in your views? Uh, I would like to hear some of it. And if you have your own specific question, please do come forward. Thank you very much.